All right, everybody. Good news, everyone. Futurama. People still watch Futurama? Uh, yeah. I can be Farnsworth. Um, I got the grades fixed, kind of. It does this weird thing. Canvas is, is hard-coded here so that it automatically, if it has a due date before the midterm, it automatically removes it from the second grading period. And by default, it only shows you your grade for the grading period that we are in, which is now the second half of the semester. So basically, all the grades were still there. They just weren't showing up. Um, and to get them to show up again properly and do the calculations properly, I had to remove all the due dates from everything that was due before midterm. Now everything should be showing up right. Um, but if you still have anything outstanding that you're planning on turning in from before midterm, it won't be flagged as late and because it doesn't have a due date. You just are going to have an assignment out there. It won't show up as overdue. But the due dates are in the title of the assignment now. I just went back and added the due dates to the title of the assignment so that we know what the due dates were. We can kind of get around trick canvas into making it do what I want it to do. I don't know. And since I want to know what the original due date was when it comes to grading late work, um, Really, I just wanted to get rid of grading periods and make it all just one because it's one grade for this class. But um, there's a couple assignments that are like doubled. Like there's the take home exam, and then there's also homework six. So the it's take home practice, but it's the same thing. The take home exam is different. So if it's if it has the same file attached to it, that's a mistake, and I'll take care of that. Okay. So don't worry about that one. That that goes with the final. There'll be some portion of the final will be some take home problem solving. So that'll that'll be. Yeah. So forget the take home exam. Just do the the practice test. Okay. So. So one of them is out of zero point zero. We got a score for one of them just because one of them opened up and people started submitting to both assignments. So it's one assignment. That's just a mistake on my part. So just submit it once. If you submitted it twice, that's fine too. Oh wait, yeah. I just have. I actually see. Yeah, assignments that have graded. So not yet. No. So one more note about Canvas grades. If it shows up with no grade, with a hyphen where your score should be, that just means I haven't graded it yet. I haven't graded that assignment. If if you didn't turn it in and I go back and I go through and I grade everybody's and I give you a zero, if it shows up with a zero and you know you turned it in, then then there's a problem. But if it just shows up as a hyphen, that just means I'm behind. A lot of those. There are a lot of those right now. We can talk about your yours after class, Simone. All right. So I fixing the grades this morning took me about three hours. Um, so so I didn't have a chance to grade all the quizzes. I went through the first half of the quizzes from over the weekend to get all, to look at your questions. So that we can, so that I could try and answer some of them uh, if they were relevant. Everybody had lots of questions about pH, so we're going to go over some of the pH questions. And um, some are just kind of general. How can you apply pH or calculations and titrations to everyday life? Um, well, you know, there's a lot of places where where the acidity of a solution winds up being important. Effectively, any solution that is going to have any living organisms as part of it. So any sort of fermentation process, the pH of the solution winds up being really important. And that means your water quality and your starting concentrations of all your, your um, ions and minerals that are dissolved in water can wind up affecting things like fermentation, which affects everything from making kombucha to beer to yogurt to cheese are all gonna be affected by pH. And the number one way you can test what you know, how 
buffered the system is, how well it's going to be able to use that particular water source for making a specific fermented product is going to depend on uh, a titration, basically. Um, that's still the way that that most water quality reports are done for, for certain contaminants and certain things that are dis dissolved in the water. So it does show up, especially if you're going into the biological sciences, pH and titrations are going to be a pretty big um, part of your of your career. Um, as far as everyday life, pH calculations, maybe not so much, but just tasting how sour something is, is effectively measuring the pH. The more acidic something tastes, the, um, then the more the lower the pH will be, right? Because more acidic is going to be it's going to be a lower pH because we have that negative log of H3O plus concentration. Right, and so second question is, is it possible to have a negative pH solution? Absolutely. We usually think of pH as being a scale between zero and 14, um, but how could mathematically, how would you get a negative pH? So if, if your log of your hydronium concentration is positive, what gives you, when you take the log of something, how do you get a positive number? Or when do you get a positive number when you take a log of something? When it's greater than, when it's greater than one. If your H3O plus concentration is greater than one, then you have a negative pH because you have that negative sign in front. So when you take the, the log of 1.5, you're going to get a negative number and negative of a negative gives you a, a sorry, you're going to get a positive number. And so then you'll take the negative of that. So you, you can have a negative pH, especially with, um, with the strong acids. It's pretty hard to get a negative pH with weak acids. Um, but it, it probably can be done. I would have to look at numbers to know for sure. Um, yeah, you can definitely have a negative pH. And it just means, it, yeah, it is extremely acidic. And that anytime any of these strong acids have a concentration greater than one. So if you had a concentration of HCl of 2.0 moles per liter, that's going to have a negative pH. Um, I'm going to skip the temperature question since I just said strong acid to go to the, the second to last question, which is what's the difference between a strong and a weak acid? Does anybody remember what we how we defined a strong acid? Say it louder. Close, higher potential lose it. It's related to how easily it loses that proton. Yeah, that's having a proton an H plus that something can lose makes it an acid. If it's a strong acid, our definition of a strong acid means that it does that within sig figs 100% of the time when you put it in water. So every acid, when you put it in water, is going to make a little bit of hydronium and the conjugate base of your acid. If it's a strong acid, we say that this reaction happens to completion. Basically, we can just use stoichiometry to predict how much hydronium we're going to make and it's a one-to-one -one ratio. A weak acid is anything when you put it in water, it still goes through this reaction, but it's an equilibrium reaction, not going to completion. It's gonna go some percentage of the way to completion. So you're not gonna get a one-to-one -one ratio of H3O plus to your starting material, right? And so how do we represent that? We use acetic acid, C2H3O2. How do we represent that as an equilibrium reaction? Does anybody remember? Two arrows. Two arrows, forward arrow and a reverse arrow. So this same reaction happens, except it's not just going to be governed by stoichiometry. It's going to be governed by that equilibrium constant. Jay? And then do you have to draw when you do the two arrows, does it have to be just like with one, like point end of the No, that's not, not as picky there. Um, okay, so that's just as correct. Just okay. you don't want both 
you don't want a double sided arrow on the same line. That means something different. All right. And then does temperature affect the pH of something? It, especially when it comes to weak acids, um, it does. But even with the strong acids, it will affect the pH to some extent. Because in every water-based solution, you also have water acting as acting as an acid and a base with itself, right? That's where the P that 14 for pH came from was this equilibrium reaction, right? H2O plus H2O makes H3O plus and hydroxide. So that's an equilibrium reaction. That's how we got our definition of pH and how we got that pH plus pOH equals 14. And equilibrium constants are 100% affected by temperature. Um, in fact, they can be affected really, really greatly by temperature because it turns out the other, the way we can calculate K has to do with the, the energy, um, the change in energy of a reaction. And it winds up being E to the minus delta G for the reaction over RT, um, where delta, so delta G is the change in energy for the reaction, R is a constant, and T is the temperature. So actually, temperature shows up in an exponential uh, term. So temperature can affect equilibrium constants a really, really big way. You can change equilibrium uh, if, you're, if you are not close to standard temperature. Um, which means you can definitely affect the pH of a solution if you're at different temperatures. It's going to be measured as, as being significantly different. All right, last, another question about equilibrium, and then we'll do some practice with equilibrium because a lot of you also sit, just said things like, what the heck is equilibrium and why do I not understand any of that? Um, because it's new, it's a new idea. It's basically, you know, we can't trust stoichiometry anymore to just predict how much product we're going to make when we have equilibrium involved, which is a new idea. Um, so in an equilibrium reaction, how would excess reactant affect the equilibrium point? Or would it? If we had a reaction that was happening to equilibrium, going to equilibrium, I'm just going to make up a reaction so I don't have to try and remember an equilibrium constant off the top of my head. Say so we have a plus 2B goes to C plus 3D. If we just have some reaction like this, it's an equilibrium reaction. What's the first rule of equilibrium? Products over reactants, right? means that when it gets to equilibrium, it doesn't matter what you started with. It matters that you get back to that same ratio of products over reactants. So K, what would K be? What would the expression for K be in this case? What's the first rule of equilibrium? Products over reactants. So concentration of C times concentration of D to the third over concentration of A times B squared. So nowhere in there does it say that it matters where you started for the concentration, right? All that matters is that you get to this ratio at some point. All right, so if we did an ice table for this, if we didn't have the perfect amount, we didn't have a two to one ratio of B to A. So let's say we had three moles, 3.0 molar A and 2.0 molar B. That's not really gonna affect the math that much because we're still just going to go through and say, well, I'm using up one A and forever. So we're going to be minus X for A, right? And 
let's say we start with zero C and zero D, what would be the rest of the change row? What would the rest of that look like? B would be plus or minus. Are we using it up or making or making it? Using it up, so it's minus two X because for every one A, we're using two B. So for C, is it a plus or a minus? Plus, and how many X's? Just one X, right? And for D, what would we get? Plus three X. Right, so all these ice tables are is really just a way of, of keeping track of where you started, what the change is, and then E is always just gonna be what you end at, right? And so that's just gonna be adding up the, the, the column above it. So 3.0 minus X, two minus two X, X and three X. So again, it doesn't really matter, does it? Do we even have to start with zero for C and D? No, we can start with any amount for any of these and it doesn't change our process. So in some ways this is actually easier to keep track of than, than the way we've been doing stoichiometry problems because it keeps track of everything at once. You don't have to remember, oh, was that moles of A or moles of B? We've got all of that here in one table. And you can use ice tables for regular stoichiometry problems too. Traditionally, they get used in equilibrium problems. But if I asked you a question that just said, okay, it's not an equilibrium problem. It's just a regular stoichiometry problem. And I want to know the final concentrations of everything. This is still a good way to do that because you're going to run out of something. Your limiting reactant is going to be zero at the end, right? but then everything else is changing relative to each other as well, right? So this is just a good way to do stoichiometry in general once you get the hang of it. So then if we wanted to actually solve this mess, we would probably need a solver, right? Because when we, if we, regardless of what number K is at equilibrium, if we wanted to know what X is, we'd have to plug it in, we'd get X times, 3x to the third over 3 minus x times 2 minus 2x squared. That's a mess of an algebra problem to solve for x, right? But if you have your solver handy, that's not too tricky. And I'm going to show you a trick for in certain cases we can we can get around how messy these problems get. Yeah. Sorry? The coefficient from the balance reaction. I just erased it, but, but it's to the power of two because it was two B. And this one's to the power of three because it was gives you 3D, right? So the three just becomes power when you write your products over reactants. If you want a number, so let's say, I'm, let's make up a number, let's call it 2.5 times 10 to the minus seven is K. Then you could actually plug it in and get an answer. Could it be negative? How would we know? What are the what are the numbers you get for for x here? So only one of those can be right because you can't have equilibrium two different equilibriums happening. So how do we know which one is right and why? Yeah, we can't, if we started with, remember our, our final concentration of D was zero plus three X, right? If X is negative, we get a negative concentration for D. 
at equilibrium. We can't have a negative concentration of anything. You can have a negative change in concentration, but you can't have a negative concentration. So that tells us right there, it has to be the positive 0.18. All right, so let's do one where we don't wind up with a super complicated algebra. So this is really the easier way to ask equilibrium questions is if I give you starting concentrations and equilibrium concentrations, can you find K? So for this reaction, phosphorus pentachloride is put into a one liter vessel and heated. And at equilibrium, it contains 0.4 moles of phosphorus trichloride and 4.4 moles of chlorine gas. Write out the reaction and then let's figure out what K is based on these equilibrium concentrations. What does the reaction look like? We started with just PCL5 it says, right? And it says you added heat, but that's not going to be a reactant, really, right? Or a product. And what are we making? Do we have to do anything to balance it? Nope, this is a friendly one, right? I mean, relatively speaking. So if this is our reaction, what is our expression for K? Products over reactants, right? So at equilibrium, concentration of chlorine gas times concentration of PCL3 over concentration of PCL5. So to find the equilibrium constant, we just need the equilibrium concentration of all three of these. So this one with the stoichiometry being simple, you might be able to figure this one out in your head, but this is a perfect example of where we might wanna use an ice table because we have an initial concentration of one component and then we have equilibrium concentrations of the products. What's our initial concentration of everything? And we're in a one liter vessel, right? So it says moles, but it's moles per liter also since it's in a one liter vessel. If it wasn't in a one liter vessel, you would just need to take that moles and put it into, into um, molarity terms. Do we start with any product? Not in this case, it doesn't say anything. It just says that our mole of, of PCL5 is put into a vessel. So if it doesn't give you any information, you can assume you don't have any product to start with. What, what else do we know? How do we fill the rest of this in? So how do we fill in C, our C row change? minus x, plus x, plus x. So what's x? Well, your initial amount plus the change equals your final amount, right? So zero plus x equals 0.4. It's pretty simple, isn't it? It's just 0.4. X is 0.4. So what's your equilibrium concentration of PCL5? 
see how these ice tables help with just basic stoichiometry because you keep track of everything at once and it's all tied together. Now we have everything we need to plug it in and solve for K. At equilibrium, here's our concentrations. So we plug it in here. K is equal to 0 0.40 times 0 0.40 over 0.32. Ish. So if you know equilibrium concentrations, getting to K is just a matter of filling in your ice table. You don't even have to be given all of the equilibrium concentrations. As long as you have one complete column here, you can fill in the rest. Okay. So the only difference is we're not going to equilibrium, we're going to till your uh, limiting reactant goes to zero. One of them needs to be zero. You still want to know what the limiting reactant is going to be. And then for whatever the limiting reactant is, you set your end concentration to zero. And then everything else, you fill in the same way. I'll say that one more time. The only difference between equilibrium ice tables and regular ice tables is that in a going to completion ice table, one of your reactants is going to end with a concentration of zero. Because the way we've been doing our limiting reactant calculations and our stoichiometry problems, we always just say, okay, it goes until your limiting reactant runs out, right? So one of your, if it's a limiting reactant, question or if it was a normal stoichiometry or theoretical yield question you would just whatever your limiting reactant is on the reactant side has to have a zero at the end so the same way that we set we know that these ones ended at point four you know that your limiting reactant ends at zero all the equilibrium does changes things is it lets us it tells us where it's going to stop in the middle All right, let's do one more of these and then we'll get the gas loss. So white vinegar, acetic acid is a weak acid because it's not one of our strong acids, right? Our strong acids are going to, are there's six of them, right? Hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic, perchloric, sulfuric, and nitric. If it's not one of those, we said seven, the chloric acid is usually also considered, but it's not as common of an acid. If it's not one of those, it's a weak acid. So acetic acid has a starting concentration and we know what the equilibrium constant is. What's the pH of the vinegar? Start by writing out your reaction. And in this case, we're talking about a weak acid reacting with water, which is gonna make what? Hydronium and the conjugate base, right? Take your weak acid. What does it look like after you take one of the protons away? So if we want the pH, we need the equilibrium concentration of H3O plus, right? Mm -hmm. So let's start by writing, in a, writing an ice table and then start filling in everything that we know and seeing how, what we eventually wanna do, we want a number 
for a concentration of hydronium at the end, right? That's our end goal here so that we can take the negative log and get pH. What do we know initially? Eight, five, seven, two. What's the third rule of equilibrium? So the first two are products over reactants, right? Third rule is solids and liquids don't show up in our equilibrium expression, right? Because they have a constant concentration. So basically, if it's a solid or a liquid, it doesn't matter for equilibrium. We can just ignore it. So if it's a solid or a liquid, it's not going to show up in our K expression, which means it doesn't affect anything about the rest of the equilibrium. Not for the purposes of equilibrium. It's still a reactant in terms of limiting reactant questions, but not when it comes to equilibrium. But the amount, the amount changes, but it doesn't affect the equilibrium. How much hydronium and how much acetate do we start with? It doesn't tell us, so we can assume zero. For our change row, anything tricky here? Just pluses and minuses, right? Everything's one to one. So we're going to use up acetic acid, so it's minus X. Anything on the reactant side always going to be minus, right? And anything on the product side will always be plus. So at equilibrium, our acetic acid concentration is 8572 minus X, X, X. Okay, now what do we do? We've got to solve for X. So we need to write out our K, right? K is equal to products over reactants. Right? Water doesn't show up because it's liquid, not a solution. Given K, 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. And we know we have an expression for each of these, right? So we can say X times X over. Point eight five seven two minus x. All right, here's the part where those of you who are, aren't as familiar with solvers can still get an answer here. This is a, it's almost like algebra sleight of hand. Um, math teachers don't particularly like doing this because it doesn't give you the true answer. It gives you the answer that's good enough within sig figs. If K is really small, what does that tell us about our concentrations of products and reactants at equilibrium? Which side is gonna be bigger, the top or the bottom? The bottom. If K is really small, then the bottom is much more favored than the top, right? you have a much bigger concentration down here than you have at the top, right? So what does that tell you about how big or small is X? X is gonna be really small, right? Well, if X is going to be really small, that means our equilibrium concentration of acetic acid is gonna be really close to what? 
the number we started with. If X is tiny, this number is not gonna change by very much, is it? So it's a valid math step in this class to say, assume X is close to zero. You literally just write the words, assume X is approximately zero. Because if X is close to zero, anytime we're subtracting or adding X to anything, it's not changing very much from your initial amount, right? So after you write this assumption, we can actually just rewrite this without this minus X here. We can't get rid of these two X's because then we wind up solving for nothing. There is no X left to solve for then, right? But anytime that you have a difference and we know X is gonna be small, we can just ignore it. And we can just say, we get wind up simplifying this, we get X squared over 0 0.8572. That we can solve, right? The other one wasn't impossible to solve. It just involves using the quadratic equation, but nobody likes using the quadratic equation if you don't have to. I shouldn't say nobody. I don't want to make assumptions about people, but I've never thought to myself, you know what? I don't need to, but I'm going to do the quadratic equation anyway. So what do we get for an answer? Zero, zero, three. If you know how to use your solver, then you don't have to make this assumption. So here's how you show your work if you're using a solver. Listen up real quick. If you're going, if you're not going to make this assumption and you're going to use it, solve it do, using a solver, you actually, you still have to tell me how you're solving for X. I don't need to see every step, but writing, I used a solver is a valid math step in this class too. I'm not, it's not an algebra class, but I still want to know how you got to your answer. So you either have to write, assume X is close to zero, or I used a solver to get X. Anybody use a solver and get a different answer? Philip, what was your question? Perfect question, because that's exactly where we're headed. If you make this assumption, you have to show, in order for this assumption to be valid, we basically make the arbitrary cutoff as long as X is less than 5% of your starting value. X is less than 5% of your starting value, then your assumption was valid and you're good to go. If X is greater than 5% of your starting value, you either have to use a solver or you have to pull out the quadratic equation and do it the long way. Just write the word solver. So somebody plug this into solver the original way. What do we get? So we're only keeping two sig figs. Our solver answer was different by one digit right here, which was already going to get rounded off anyway. So within sig figs, we get the same answer whether we do it the hard way or if we make the assumption. Usually about 10 to the minus five is when K is small enough to make that 5% cut off. If K is smaller than 10 to the minus five, you can make this assumption. If K is bigger than 10 to the minus five, you're probably going to have to do it by hand or use a solver. And things have definitely changed since I was taught this because only, only the really, the really rich kids with engineer parents that bought them TI-89s had solvers. TI-83, when I was in high school, the old version of TI-83 didn't have a solver that could handle this, really. Um, and we weren't taught how to use the solvers in our math classes at that point. So 
unless you happen to be the one student out of 30 that actually had a solver and knew how to use it, everybody had to make these assumptions. Now, I think most of you have some experience with using a solver and that's fine too. All right. We feeling a little bit better about equilibrium now and ice tables? Like I said, I like equilibrium. I think these are that's a fun math trick to know, right? All right. So let's talk about gases now. So Back in the, this would have been probably the early 1800s, maybe late 1700s. Um, this is, you know, right around the same time as Dalton's atomic theory first became popularized and, and started to be, research started to be done. Um, but physicists were already working on how gases behaved. So they didn't understand what chemicals were, what molecules were, what atoms were. But they did start doing experiments with, with gases. And one of the first experiments that they did is um, they effectively sealed a piston full of, sealed a cylinder full of gas with a movable piston. So think like a, kind of like a syringe with the plunger that goes up and down, except sealed at the bottom. So if you had this sealed, this sealed container, what happens to this container when you start pushing down on the piston? Pressure increases. What is pressure? How much? How much of a fluid? Who's had physics? Pounds per square inch. You know the units. What type of unit is pounds? Pounds is technically not mass. It's weight, which is a weight is a fancy way of saying force of gravity on an object, right? So it's pounds per square inch is a combined unit, just like density, where we get a force on top and an area on bottom. So for or, um, pressure in general is just force over area. You have a set amount of force divided by a fixed area that gives you pressure. Is that really that different than force? Depends on the situation, right? If I tell you I'm going to throw something, I'm going to throw a beach ball at you that weighs as much as a golf ball. Are you really that worried about that? If I tell you I'm going to throw a golf ball at you, are you worried about that? Yeah. What's the difference? They're the same mass, more, more surface area. The same force over a smaller area means more pressure. Has anybody ever tried to cut something with a dull knife? You have to push a lot harder, right? What's the difference between a dull knife and a sharp knife? Well, one cuts better. Thank you. <laughs> the sharp one has a smaller area because it's, if you tried to cut something with a really, really dull knife that looked something like a hammer, that's not going to cut very well, is it? that has a lot of area, even compared to a dull knife. So what causes pressure when we're talking about a gas? How much gas is pushing out on the container? How is it pushing out on it? Molecules are bouncing around. You might not know what molecules are back in the 1700s, but 
they had this idea that they were just these tiny little, the gas was, were just these tiny little particles bouncing around. So if you, if you filled a, a 55 gallon drum with ping pong balls and you shook it really, really hard, those ping pong balls are gonna be bouncing all over on the inside, right? If they're changing direction, that means that there's a force on the ping pong balls. Force is what causes acceleration or is measured, a way to measure acceleration of an object. So if they're changing direction when they hit the walls of the container, that means they're pushing on the container too. Containers pushing on the ball, the ball pushes on the container. That's what's causing these the pressure on the ins. When we're talking about gas pressure, we're talking about the fact that these tiny little golf balls, ping pong balls, however you want to visualize them, when they bounce off the edges of the container, they're pushing on the container. So, what happens when we change <laughs> if pressure is always defined as a force over an area? What's changing when we push down on the piston? Area, is the force changing? Those gas molecules are still bouncing around just as fast, right? They're still bouncing around just as fast, but they have less area. Pressure should go up, right? And so when they did this experiment, so the, the way mathematically we, would, we could write this is that we could say that the pressure is going to be proportional to one over the volume. In other words, they're inversely proportional. When volume goes up, what is the pressure gonna do? Pressure should go down. Because again, if the volume goes up, the area goes up, right? If the area goes up, pressure goes down. So we can actually do this. This is actually going to be your lab this week. We're going to take some syringes. We're going to basically use, use ring stands and clamp them into a rubber stopper so that they're a sealed container. Then you're going to balance heavy objects on top of them. And you're going to look at how the volume changes. And then you're going to calculate how much pressure you added by balancing a book on top of the syringe. And you're going to get a, a, a number for the total <laughs> pressure on the inside. If you change the volume, the volume goes down. And it's not showing the other data points. It should show up. If you cut your volume in half, let's try and put some numbers to it. If you cut your volume in half, we expect pressure to go up, but by how much? Two, why? And because if if pressure going up means volume goes down and vice versa, then they should go at the same ratio, right? If you cut one in half, the other one doubles. If you double one, the other one gets cut in half. What happens if you just keep going? Let's say we double the volume. We'll write it out on here since my graph is not showing up. So let's say this is 10 liters and one, call it, um, units on there are in atmospheres, which is just sort of the arbitrary. We say, okay, the definition of one atmosphere of pressure is the, the normal barometric pressure at sea level at standard temperature. They just sort of averaged it for all major cities and got a number. So one atmosphere of pressure and 10 liters. If we double that to 20 liters, what should the pressure be? We would expect it to be about 0.5. What happens if we double it again? I can do this close to, close to, to, to scale. 0.25, right? What happens if we increase the volume again? So we went from 10 liters to 20 liters to 40 liters to 80 liters. 
What's 0.25 cut in half, right? Are we ever going to get to a point where the pressure is zero? No, because you would have to have an infinite volume for that to happen. Do we have an infinite volume anywhere? How about space? And now we're getting into a debate with Einstein. Einstein has that famous quote, there's only two things I'm sure about are infinite. One is the universe and the second is the stupidity of people and I'm not sure about the first. So Einstein didn't even know. And we still don't really know if there's an end to the universe. If you go to, into deep space, you actually can measure a pressure of gas. It's very, very small. It's like 10 to the minus, 10 to the minus 10 atmospheres. Yeah, so we're talking about a very, very small amount of gas particles, but there is still pressure in deep space because it never actually goes to zero. What about the reverse? What, instead of doubling the volume, what if we cut the volume in half? We would expect to see our pressure double. Extrapolate this one. Can you ever get to zero volume? Because what would happen to the pressure if you did? You would have infinite pressure, which again, not even a black hole, right? Even if we get to astronomical numbers, literally astronomical numbers, you can never have infinite pressure. <laughs> All right, so this leads to a quick algebra der derivation. This realization that for a closed system of gas at constant temperature, pressure times volume equals a constant. And what happens then is we can actually take, we can take that expression say, okay, for a closed gas at a constant temperature, it's always gonna be equal to a constant. So you, that allows us to say that as long as it's a clo the same closed gas at the constant temperature, any combination of pressure times volume is equal to the same constant, which means they're equal to each other. So if you have a closed system of gas and you change the volume, you can predict what the new pressure is going to be. You just need to know your starting pressure and volume and at least one of these two numbers, right? You still need to know three out of four pieces of this equation to solve it. But it means it's not actually all, all that tricky. It's not that complicated of a relationship. And here's mathematically how you do it. If it's not as easy as I doubled it, what happened to the pressure? That's easy to do that math in your head. If it's, I took the volume and, I'm, uh, and I increased it by 33%, that's a little bit trickier to do in your head, right? So let's do a practice. If we have a closed system at constant temperature and our initial pressure is 1.0 atmospheres and our initial volume is 10 liters, and let's say we increase the volume to 13.5 liters. What's the new pressure? Well, let's plug things in. 1.0 ATM. 10.0 liters. We don't know what the new pressure is. That's what we're trying to find. I said 13.5 liters is our new volume. What is it? 13.5. 
Point seven. How many sig figs are we going to keep? Two sig figs. Does it matter what units pressure and volume are in? As long as they're consistent, it doesn't matter what units they're in. Doesn't matter what pressure units you want to use. If you want to use pounds per square inch like a heathen, then you can use pounds per square inch as long as it's the same on both sides and same for your volumes. You can use gallons if you want. You can use gills. Does, it, does anybody know what a gill is? Heard of it from Archer probably? Archer season wise. I'll have a, I'll have a gill of, of brandy, I think, at one point, maybe season two. I think it's four ounces. It's a common unit for making for making drinks. It's on your conversion sheet. Or maybe on your, it was on one of your practice, conversion practices, not on the conversion sheet. One of the yeah, early yeah. practices had you convert gills to something else. Okay. So, Pressure and volume are related this way. This is called Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law is P1V1 equals P2V2. What were, this, what were the conditions that I said? Has to be what? I said it has to be this constant temperature and in the same closed gas system. So if you had a balloon and you squeeze the balloon, why does it pop? Because the pressure goes up. How else can you make a balloon pop? You, same thing, relative, but you can heat it up. If you leave, if you leave Blow up a balloon all the way so it's right at the edge of popping, and then you put it into a, a car in July with the windows rolled up. It's a pretty good chance you're going to come back to the balloon having popped, right? Because temperature is going to play a role in here, too. How else can you change the volume without changing the pressure inside? What if it wasn't a tied balloon? Well, altitude but we'll talk about that in a second. If it's not tied and you let go of the nozzle, what happens to the volume of the balloon? Right, what changed? The volume, but what else? It's not closed, you change the moles of gas molecules. So has to be closed, has to be constant temperature for this to work. So what happens when we change, if we change the temperature? Yeah, so it's not really very safe to heat a closed gas system with a fixed volume. So they went the other route. Instead of measuring the pressure and heating it up, they actually just let the piston move. So they were measuring a change in volume and saying that it's a constant pressure on the inside because it's pushing against the atmospheric pressure, which isn't changing very much, right? So if you double the temperature, what would you expect to happen? What changes? So we'll still think about it in terms of pressure just because it's easier to think about what's happening. Which of these is changing if you heat it up? Is the area change? So if anything's going to change here, it would be the force. How does that make sense? You're making the gas molecules move faster. Temperature is just measuring the kinetic energy of how fast the gas, the gas molecules are moving, right? So if you make them move faster, they hit with more force. We'll go back to me throwing golf balls at you as an analogy. If I'm just lobbing them like this, you're might be a little bit worried, but not very much, right? 
if I get out the slingshot, the wrist rocket, and start shooting golf balls at people, we're worried, right? More pressure with the same area because we had more force. Don't use a wrist rocket to shoot golf balls at people or anything. It's a great way to get arrested. Technically, that's a deadly weapon. Um, so don't do that. When you can kill somebody with it. And it turns out a wrist rocket, a fifth grader with a wrist rocket and golf balls can kill people. Oh, that's horrible. It, it is. <laughs> What's that? Depends on the intent, but a baseball bat counts as a deadly weapon. You're not allowed to carry a baseball bat in public without a glove and a ball as well. <laughs> All right, so we would expect if we double the temperature, the force should double, right? But we don't actually see that. If you go from 20 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius, pressure only goes up or the volume only goes up a tiny amount. Why would that be the case? That's a good guess. Let's make the assumption that we're in an ideal, perfect world where no energy is lost to the surroundings. When you double the con the uh, temperature in Celsius, you only get a tiny increase. It doesn't make that much difference. What happens at zero Celsius? Can you double zero Celsius? Do the molecules still have force at zero Celsius? They're still moving at zero Celsius, right? So if the molecules are still moving at zero Celsius, when you go from 20 to 40, you're not actually doubling the temperature because you're not doubling the force of the molecules. What do we have to be in order to, to do this properly, what does the function have to look like? I'll give you a hint, it's not gonna be a straight line like that. It, good guess, let me, let me clarify. It, it will still be a straight line. What would be different in Kelvin? Who, who remembers how we defined Kelvin originally? It's, yeah, we had an equation for it, right? This is actually where that equation comes from. In order for this equation to work, we need the line to go through the origin. If the line goes through the origin, then we can say doubling the pressure doubles the temp or doubling the temperature doubles the pressure, doubles the volume. So in other words, Kelvin comes from taking this exact experiment and taking ex extending that line till it hits zero. If you can just picture extending this line, I don't know, about there. And then all of a sudden, you get a point where the line goes through the origin of the graph, right? That's literally where Kelvin comes from. They just said, okay. If we want it to be a straight, it's already a straight line. We want it to be a straight line that goes through the origin. Let's just put the origin over here. Define new units instead. So that's why Kelvin was first defined is to say, okay, that's the point where you can't get any colder. If you can't get any colder, what happens to the force? If you take all of those golf balls bouncing around and you give them zero velocity, Pressure goes to zero, no force. So that's why you can't get colder than zero Kelvin is because you can't have less energy than zero. You can't have negative energy in terms of the kinetic energy of these, these molecules. So this is called Charles law. And the, this definition says, okay, volume is proportional to temperature which again, proportional just means that if you graphed it, if you graphed volume versus temperature in Kelvin, 
you get a straight line that goes through the origin. If you're in Kelvin, that allows us to write a similar rule to what we had before. So if it's volume over temperature, and vo equals volume two over temperature two. So cool, we were able to relate volume to temperature, volume to pressure. How can we, without doing a dangerous experiment where you take a closed gas and um, increase the temperature, how can we incorporate volume or pressure in temperature then? If we're able to say that volume over temperature is proportional or volume is proportional to temperature and volume is also proportional to one over pressure, we can just do a quick substitution and do some algebra to get Gay-Lussac's law. Because you're just able to say, oh, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. And turns out it's a little bit harder to write the proof for it, but you can say the same thing with things that are proportional to each other. If A is proportional to B and B is proportional to C, then A is proportional to C. And again, with my formatting, sorry. So what, should, what do we expect it would look like if we replace volume with pressure? If you double the temperature in Kelvin, what should happen to the pressure? It should double, right? So it should also be directly proportional. So what does the version with pressure and temperature look like? P1 over T1, P2 over T2. All right, we're not gonna stop to do examples of these. They work the same way as Boyle's law does. You have to have three pieces, you can solve for the fourth. Because I wanna get to the combined gas law, which involves all of the variables. What's the one variable we haven't touched yet? We said, okay, what are the ways we can change the volume of the balloon? We can squeeze it and that increases the pressure, right? We can untie it, let gas out, that changes the pressure. We can change the temperature, that changes the pressure. So letting gas molecules out, that's gonna change what? The amount of gas. And how do we measure amount of, of molecules? What units? Moles. So, Let's do the same sort of logic. The variable we use for moles is a lowercase n, which is for number of molecules. If you see capital N as a variable, that means how many atoms or molecules you have in raw numbers. So like six times 10 to the 23. You see lowercase n, that means you put it in moles. It literally is just from number. So let's picture our balloon. We're keeping it the same temperature, keeping it the same volume. What happens if we double the amount of gas molecules? What happens to the pressure? So Pressure is equal to force over area. If we're not changing the volume, then area is staying constant, right? We're not changing the speed of the molecules, but we're changing how many molecules we have. So go back to me throwing golf balls at you. I'm not getting out the wrist rocket, but this time I'm gonna have you sit there and I'm gonna throw golf balls at your forehead for 15 minutes straight. Even though the first one might not hurt, by the end, because he's closest, and I already threw golf balls at Derek enough. 
So by the end, that's a lot of force, right? 15 minutes of getting hit with golf balls, it starts to hurt. So we would expect that the number of gas molecules might change force, right? If you double the number of gas molecules, what did you do to the force? Doubled it. So again, we would expect it to be directly proportional. So what is the equation gonna look like that relates pressure and moles? P1 over N1 equals P2 over N2. That's, actually I think it's with volume rather than pressure, but that's Avogadro's law. Avogadro of Avogadro's number, because he was the one who started measuring moles. All right, how is this all connected? Well, come back right here. All of these things are proportional to each other, right? Which means we can actually combine all of these laws into one. What was the first law? Charles Boyle's law. P1, V1 equals P2, V2, right? Moles and temperature go on the bottom of the fraction, right? So as long as one thing is being held constant, we can actually just have one version of all these simple gas laws. This is called the combined gas law because as long as one thing is held constant, the rest of them can all change. What happens if you hold your number of moles constant? What happens to N? If N1 is equal to N2, you're dividing both sides of the equation by the same number, right? What mathematically can we do then? Cancel them out. Anything that's held constant, you just cancel it out on both sides and you get the relevant gas law. Anything that's changing, you leave it in. So this is the way it's written on your equation sheet. All of these gas laws together are written as one combined gas law that looks like this. And that also means that all four of these variables for any gas, these are all the things that we could change that we use to describe a gas, right? It means that if we know all of these, the ratio of P pressure times volume over moles times temperature in Kelvin is always equal to the same constant, which we call the gas constant. What letter do we use? R. R. They will always be equal to the same constant, which means they're also equal to each other. I saw a hand over here a minute ago. Joel. If they're all changing at the same time, it doesn't really matter. You still need to know three out of the four at the end, right? It just means that you might be better off using PV equals NRT rather than using this, this version that has them written out separately. All right, we'll do more practice with this on Wednesday and then Thursday, you're gonna measure Boyle's Law.